This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. As we continue to explore the world of quantum, we reached out to quantum physicist Dr. Spiros Mihalakis, a staff researcher and manager of outreach at IQIM, the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter at Caltech, a National Science Foundation Physics Frontier Center. Dr. Spiro, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me back. Uh, how did your role at IQIM bring you to be representing the United States for World Quantum Day? That's a good question. Uh, I may not know the answer fully myself. Um, I received an email almost exactly two years ago from Charlie Tatton, who is the director of the National Quantum Coordination Office. And someone must have nominated me for the role um, to the global coordination team for World Quantum Day. So he just shoot me an email and said, uh, you know, would you like to do this? I had some questions, but I jumped on the opportunity. Uh, what, what sort of activities are you doing as part of this? We're doing a lot of activities uh, for World Quantum Day. Uh, one of the uh, favorites, I guess, is Quantime. Uh, Quantime is an initiative that was developed in partnership with the Q12 Education Partnership. And this is actually something that the National Science Foundation has proudly funded. Um, and the idea is to create a version of Hour of Code, but for quantum physics in classrooms. The idea that on April 14th and all the way up to the end of May, teachers can choose one or more activities that we have developed uh, to do in their classrooms, to introduce the next generation of students to quantum physics. And it includes games and includes hands-on activities with different kids. And should be a lot of fun. Everyone should uh, go to Quantime and sign up. That's fantastic. Uh, do you have any more information about what exactly the activities are? Yes, uh, there is uh, several activities, uh, some of which we developed um, in collaboration at Institute for Quantum Information and Matter, in collaboration with uh, Google, Quantum AI Division, and other universities, the University of Western Illinois. Um, and we went with uh, quantum chess and puzzles that we developed within the game of quantum chess so that the students can get more familiarity in an embodied, intuitive way of what it means to have things be in superposition, be entangled with each other. Um, there is a lot of fun ways to do all of that when you're looking at a game and you're just moving pieces around without all the interesting math. Uh, one of the things we wanted to ask you about is how important is it to have public specific events to help introduce the world of quantum? I think the idea behind World Quantum Day, what I really love about this initiative, is that it urges, I guess, and invites the public to discover the language that the universe speaks. And that language is quantum physics. And it is important to learn any language as early as possible. This is how you become fluent, you become a native speaker. And it's such a powerful language. So if you can learn to speak languages like that, where it allow you to communicate and change the world around you, the same way that learning a programming language is so powerful, I think it is very exciting to be part of an initiative that uh, pushes for something like this. That's fantastic. Thinking about some of the ways people learn things, what is the greatest misconception about quantum? From my point of view, and this may come as a surprise, the greatest misconception that may actually be part of everyone, including experts who are working on quantum physics, is that it is actually just a theory of physics. First, most people will think of quantum physics as just a theory of the subatomic realm, the quantum realm, as we call it, where the rules of classical mechanics, Newtonian physics, don't really apply and things can be at two places at the same time. They can be connected to each other over vast distances to quantum entanglement. But to me, the most interesting aspect of quantum physics, when you dig into the mathematics of it, and the foundations of it, is that it is a theory of knowledge. It is probably the most incredible theory that humanity has come across, stumbled across, I would say to try to understand everything that is around us, including space and time itself, as something that may not be fundamental. So I want to express like a very deep excitement and awe about quantum physics because it forces us as human beings to occupy different points of view. In fact, it tells us that in order to really know 
how the world really works, you have to work with each other. You have to talk to others. You have to interact with the world around you in ways that may have been alien or new. Um, can you give us an example of a surprising or counterintuitive quantum phenomena and explain why it occurs? Obviously, the one I guess I would choose is quantum entanglement. Uh, quantum entanglement is surprising in many ways, one of which is that it creates a connection between things that could be very, very far apart from each other that seems to, to even defy the laws of Einstein's general relativity and special relativity that this kind of information between things can travel faster than the speed of light and changes in one can immediately affect changes in the other. And how do you resolve such a paradox? It seems that you cannot have things that are so very far apart know of each other right away. And I think for me, the resolution comes from a Copernican shift in how we view space and time itself. That maybe it is not that things exist on top of space and time. Maybe it is the relationship between things that forms what we call space and time. This quantum entanglement, the network of relationships between things, is what is actually creating a sense of extension and the space that you can move through and the time that you can walk through. Um, one of the other things that I, I always feel like it's important to ask you something basic that people don't understand when we have the opportunity to speak with you. Um, can you break down what superposition is for us? Yeah, superposition um, is this ability, at least the quantum version of it, quantum superposition, the ability of um, objects, quantum objects, quantum states, to be at two different uh, possible states at the same time. Uh, the ability to be both on and off as a switch, for example, a light switch. This is kind of crazy. We can't even understand what that means as, a, as humans. Um, and this is a power that we use specifically for technologies like quantum computing. When we string together quantum bits, these are bits that can be in superposition of both a zero and a one. And we put them together and then we entangle them. And then we do very powerful computations on top of them. And for me, again, quantum superposition truly is something even more fascinating than that. It is the ability that we have in the quantum realm to occupy points of view that are different, alien to everyone else's, that are somehow in between. They're not like in the zero, they're not in the one, they're kind of shifted in an angle to what we're used to. The way that we actually understand the world along specific dimensions. And it says like, what if the world was not yes or no, but it was maybe and maybe not. What does it even look like? There exist other points of view from which we can understand, look at the same thing with new eyes and gain more information. Now, is that one of the biggest challenges with supercomputers, getting the qubits to, or finding the right materials that you can use as qubits to make that possible? Yeah, one of the, the largest um, obstacles currently to having large-scale quantum computers is precisely our ability to maintain these superpositions, these quantum superpositions, and string them together with more and more qubits, with more and more quantum systems, so that we can leverage this exponential power in many cases. Um, but the problem is that we are not the only ones who want to do that. The environment, the rest of the universe, which is much larger than us and we cannot control, also wants to connect and drive these qubits to do its own beating. And the reason is actually very simple. It's because we're trying to speak the language of the universe to the universe, but it's been fluent way longer than we have, and it knows exactly what to do. And we have to learn to speak that language as fluently as it does. That's interesting. Can you... Can you explain a little more about how qubits uh, exist in a natural way? This is an interesting question. How do qubits exist in a natural way? Uh, how can an electron both have a, what we call a spin up and a spin down state at the same time? And kind of think of it as precessing, though that's not uh, quite right. But how can it be spinning like clockwise and anti-clockwise at the same time? This is, a, I think, a very deep question that goes to the foundations of quantum physics. Um, and there are many different interpretations for what that means. That maybe 
there is multiple universes and in one universe it's doing one thing and the other one's doing the other thing. And what we do with quantum computers when we utilize these qubits is to access all of these different universes at the same time within a single computer, the quantum computer, allow it to process information as if it contained all these different universes and then bring them back to the one that we exist in. Um, I am not quite sure if this is uh, the right way to think of it, but I think it's fascinating that we actually have access to these new points of view. Again, from my perspective, I think all that is happening is that we are dislodging ourselves from points of view that we thought were fundamental, that there was no other way to mm -hmm. look at the world. And all of a sudden, just by shifting this our perspective, then we can access these new possibilities as if we we're like splitting the universe in many different realities. Yeah, I think I think as technology advances, there's a lot of cases where we're seeing like with some of the astronomers we've spoke with, really seeing the very ways they define things change as they get a different perspective on them. That's right. I think it is very, very important for humanity, actually, to become comfortable, um, whether it is through quantum physics or honestly through empathy, of understanding the world from other points of view. Because it is, it's kind of amazing when you dig deeper into quantum physics and you realize that you can be looking at exactly the same thing as someone else not far away from you, and you're getting the answer yes, and they're getting the answer no, and you're both right. And this breaks our minds, right? Because we instinctively, we want to know there's a singular truth to the world. And if you're looking for a particular perspective, you will all like, you know, get the, the same answer. But the invisible thing here is that we are actually always looking at the world from different points of view. And the information that we're missing is the information of translating our point of view to the other person's point of view. And I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges I've seen when, with conversations we've had just internally talking about quantum is that everybody short circuits when they, they're like it starts getting to where it's both things at once. It really is hard to wrap your brain around. Yes, and this is amazing. Um, you asked me earlier about what is so special about superposition. And the answer is like, there's nothing special about it in, in some fundamental way. Because from the point of view of the qubit that is both zero and one, there exists a perspective that this is zero. It's a new zero, right? It's a new off position for that switch. And then the on position would be what we call zero minus one. There exists extra internal information to distinguish from every new point of view what it considers to be the on position versus the off position. It's just that we are not aligned with the right perspective. And so it is alien to us. We cannot understand the world natively from this zero plus one position. We only understand it as a zero or a one. So what do you do, right? You know, how do you understand maybe if all you ever know is yes and no? Right. Very complicated thing to think about. Um, I saw some headlines recently where they're talking about manipulating light. And I guess it comes from a theory that Einstein had circa 1916 that eventually became how we figured out to make lasers. But it's talking about quantum light, and I have no idea what that means really or why it would be useful to be approaching light in that way. Do you have any insights into this? I'm not quite sure which theory you're describing, but um, I would say the same thing that I told uh, my friends at Marvel when they put like quantum energy into the end of Ant-Man and the Wasp. And I said, there is no difference between energy and quantum energy. And in fact, everything is quantum. Uh, so light and quantum light, it's basically looking at light, which we thought of just electromagnetic radiation, through its actual essence as a quantum system itself. And as such, it has, again, things called spin and other properties that can exist in superposition that can be entangled and so on and so forth. So I assume quantum light means treating light as we should, and we should have from the beginning of, of time, uh, as a quantum object, uh, and then you unlock a lot of new powers, the same way that you can unlock the powers of quantum computing by treating electrons as the fundamental particles, right? Not just photons as quantum particles, 
The same thing you can do with light, which can then allow us to see much further into the universe. Because there's so much internal structure, so much information from the polarization and other aspects of light that we often throw away when we treat it as just little classical particles. Um, that when you access the quantum information in it, you can go a lot further. You can get a lot more out of every single photon that hits our telescopes, for example. Um, are, are you familiar with Shor's algorithm? I am very familiar right. with Shor's algorithm. Yes. So, so this is a question I noted to ask you about, but I didn't uh, set it up to ask you really. So what is Shor's algorithm and how might a quantum computer use it to crack encryption? I know security algorithm, is a bit... Yes, Shor's algorithm. Um, Shor's algorithm is the reason why we're even building quantum computers now it started the second quantum revolution uh peter shore who's now a professor at mit i think he was at bell labs when he discovered the algorithm was trying to figure out how to factor large numbers that are the product of two prime numbers very very large numbers the reason behind this is because we know at least up to now that this is very very hard for even supercomputers classical supercomputers but he had a sense that because of the periodic nature of multiplication and division, that maybe quantum computers can actually do this factoring, as we call it, right? The breaking up of a very large number into its prime factors. Primes are numbers that are only divisible by one and themselves, like 7, 13, and so on and so forth. Um, and... He actually came up with a pretty ingenious way of doing that, uh, which then changed everything because this simple algorithm would be responsible once we can run it on quantum hardware, we have large enough quantum computers to run this algorithm, would we be responsible for breaking all cryptographic systems that we rely on currently, called the RSA crypto system. Elliptic curves, there, there are different ways, but this one algorithm, if we could run it, would break all of that and could like get your password, decrypt right, your, your password <laughs> and use it. You, we wouldn't have the ability to then communicate with each other, communicate with our banks, do e-commerce, any of this stuff. Um, and the way it works is pretty fascinating. And I will give you an analogy to what it's doing. So imagine that you're in a playground and you're very distracted. You're there with your kid, right? And it wants you to like, you know, push the, uh, on the swing, but you're very distracted on your smartphone. You shouldn't be, but you are. And so you're not looking, you're just randomly pushing, right? Towards the, um, the kid and the swing. But if you don't find the natural frequency of that swing, you will actually end up stopping the kid from moving your own kid, right? So you get very upset. So how do you do that? A classical supercomputer blindly pushing would create a billion versions of the swing and push each one of them just slightly differently. And then one of them would get lucky, right? And then start resonating. And you'd be able, if you look down the row of these billion swings, you see the, the one with the large amplitude, right? The large oscillation, like I found it. I found the answer, even though I was blindly pushing. A quantum computer does something else. Why, first of all, are we not doing the classical supercomputer thing? It's because it's extremely expensive to have 1 billion computers or processors, right? Or 1 trillion of them, however many you need, because as the problem gets larger, you need more and more of these computers to run in parallel. That's not what a quantum computer does. A quantum computer almost like creates a mini multiverse inside of it where it feeds each of the universes a different frequency of pushing. And nobody knows. These are simulated in some way, right, inside of the quantum computer. And the Shor's algorithm, what it does is that it leverages the fact that every so many swings, you will have the same frequency. You'll be like hitting with the right frequency. So you become resonant with the right answer. In some of these universes, where you hit by mistake, right, the right frequency, you become resonant with that. And then the last part of the algorithm is to bring all of that back to create what we call constructive interference of all these different frequencies. And the ones that got lucky 
are the ones that are constructively interfering in you get to see them. And that's what happens when you measure at the end the outcome, you get basically the answer where all the wrong answers have disappeared and the right one has been amplified, is resonant with you. And there exists the transformation of factoring a number into exactly this process. So that's what source algorithm is doing, is able to leverage the ability of quantum physics and quantum objects to be both waves and particles, uses the wave nature, the constructive interference aspect, and distractive of all the wrong outcomes, and then brings all these universes back to, to ours and says, like, this is the one you were looking for. And I think uh, just as much as you could use it to crack encryption, they'll probably be able to use it to create whatever the future versions of encryption becomes. Of course, and that's the, the beauty um, of science. Uh, one of my good friends, Gorian Alagic, uh, who is at the National Institute for Standards and Technology, he's currently putting together uh, with colleagues there the next generation, the post-quantum cryptographic protocols that will be classical in nature, but we expect them to also be resistant to quantum threats and quantum computers, no matter how large they get. Um, so the, the last kind of area of conversation we had for you today is we want to know what are some of the major open questions or areas of active research in quantum physics that you find most interesting or exciting? I'll just go back to when I was a kid and I wanted to know if we can time travel, we can teleport, all these things. And these questions uh, are almost metaphysical, but uh, very serious research is actually happening right now to understand the structure of the fabric of space and time. Instead of just thinking of space and time as fundamental objects, like philosophers of the past did, and most of us uh, do to this day, we're trying to understand what is hiding underneath them. What is breathing life into them? And this is where you get to see, you know, concepts like quantum entanglement and superposition rare their beautiful heads and you realize that the more you start speaking that language of the universe the more fluent you become in it the more things are illuminated and they're not just something that is irreducible right you start breaking these things down into smaller parts and then the question of can we teleport becomes that of okay at the level beneath space what does it mean to teleport what does it mean to move from one point in space to another one, right? In this underlying network of relationships and entanglement. For time travel, what does it mean to be able to borrow or steal a dimension of space and put it as an extra dimension of time? So instead of moving along one dimension of time, you now move along two synthetic dimensions of time. So you don't have to go against what we call the hour of time to move back in time. You keep going forward, but in two dimensions, you're allowed to keep going forward and come all the way back. Right? Only in one dimension are you stuck trying to go back to where you, you came before, reversing direction. Things like that are very fascinating for me. Um, and I'm sure we'll see more of that in science fiction movies and Marvel movies and whatnot. Right, and th whatever the next iteration of Quantum Leap becomes. Exactly, yes. Right, well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me again. That was a blast. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Thanks to Dr. Spiros Mihalakis for joining me today. You can watch an expanded version of this conversation on our YouTube channel by searching at NSF Science. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts, and if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.